of you. You're like family already. It's just, just so wonderful to be welcomed so warmly and with such affection. And it's returned, for sure. We're very happy to be here, my husband and I. Um, first of all, I want to recognize the Hawaiian people who've cared for these lands for over a thousand years and uh, who I've learned a great deal from. I've been, we've been uh, <coughs> back and forth to Hawaii over the last 40 years. Not so many times recently, but um, we used to come when our children were little and they're now grown up and uh, our oldest daughter has four children herself. But um, one of the, the earliest uh, kind of documents that really inspired me about Hawaiian uh, management, resource management systems, was the film that's shown there, the Ahukua'a fish ponds in Lo'i. It was a video that I used and showed in my classes in the early 1990s, and up until the video disappeared and the whole system changed anyway. But uh, that was such an inspiration to see uh, at many parallels in perceptions uh, and values that are shared uh, between Native Hawaiians and Indigenous people that I work with in Northwestern North America. I want to thank all of the people who have been so kind in hosting us and spent so much time and energy to, uh, to bring us here and make us feel so welcome. And also to the Hakai Institute uh, and Tula Foundation um, directors, Eric Peterson and Christina Monk, that big grant that sounds very big when you see it. <laughs> um, it's really a five-year um, um, grant that has covered me as a research professor for five years until my retirement and covered uh, field expenses and supported my field work. So I'm very grateful to them. To Bob, who's sitting down here, my <coughs> personal photographer, <laughs> companion for a long time, and, uh, and to so many friends and colleagues and uh, the people who worked hard to get my book published. I really appreciate all of them. And here are just a few of the people the elders who have been my teachers over the years. Many of them have passed away now, but many of them are still going strong and still teaching and still passing that knowledge on. And to me, they're all here. They're all here with me. I think of them all so much. So I, I would just name them, because I'll be talking about some of them in particular. So just in clockwise, in the far um, left, is that? Uh, Dr. Mary Thomas from the Shwetmuk Nation, Clan Chief Adam Dick, Quaxi Stala from the Quaquaquaq Nation, Mrs. Ida Jones from the Dididat Nation, um, Helen Clifton from Hartley Bay, and my Haida sister, Barb Wilson, Keel Juice, um, Sam Mitchell from the Lillooet Slatton Nation, my, uh, what do you call my Sony sister, uh, Joan Morris, Sashama, and uh, Elsie Claxton from the Saanich Nation. Dr. Richard Atlio from the New Channel Nation, um, Chief Ernie Hill from the Gat uh, Nation, and the four New Hulk grannies. Uh, big <laughs> granny at one end, Dr. Margaret Cy Wallace, um, Alice, uh, sorry, Elsie Jacob, Alice Talio, and little granny Felicity Wakas at the other end. And those are just some of the many people who have been. Uh, very knowledgeable and also very generous with their teachings. So tonight I'll just give a quick introduction about ethnobotany, ethnoecology, and tell you a quick story of a time that changed my thinking about indigenous management systems. And then talk a little bit more about traditional knowledge systems and traditional management. And um, give you just a few case studies, and I'll try not to go on and on. I have to watch myself because I easily get carried away telling stories. Um, but for those of you who are not directly in this field, here's a, a definition of 
ethnoecology. It's a it's an interdiscipline, I guess you could say, that combines uh, practices and uh, ideas from ethnology uh, or the study of people and ecology, the study of living systems. Um, and with seeking to understand how we can live sustainably within our environments and what uh, ideas and models are out there that we can learn from and how can we maintain our relationships with our surroundings, with our environments and the other species we share the planet with. <coughs> in the area that I work, Northwestern North America very broadly and the, the area covered by the book, Ancient Pathways, Ancestral Knowledge, there are over 50 different languages spoken. And some of them are quite closely related, like the Salish and languages. Um, and some are, are not related to any other language that is known, like the Haida and Tanaha, as far as I know. Um, see if you might correct me there. Um, and over that area from central Alaska to, say, the Columbia River and east to the Rockies, um, there are about several hundred uh, plant and animal species that have names in those different languages and, and different kinds of relationships from being used for food or materials or medicine or being important ceremonially or, uh, or combinations of those. Um, there are also many, many stories that relate to these species and those habitats and places, ceremonies and traditions. Uh, that people know that are part of this whole system of knowledge. And what I was particularly interested in, in in the book, in the work that I did for the book, having worked with different First Nations over the last 40 plus years, I've noticed so many interesting parallels and commonalities uh, across different nations and among different people who don't necessarily know each other, have never had contact with each other, and yet they have similar kind of knowledge. And so the whole idea of the book was to think about how did people learn this rich knowledge of plants and animals and places that they have, that they've been teaching? How did they share it from one group to another, from one community to another, one region to another, and how did they adapt it? according to environmental change over the past 14,000 or so years uh, since the Pleistocene times. And, um, and with changes over landscape um, as people moved from one region to another, or as knowledge was shared from one region to another. So just briefly, this is a map showing the language groups, approximate territories of the different groups and I won't try to go into all of them, uh, but, but you can see the diversity that's there. And when you add the, uh, the diversity of vegetation and landscape and geography uh, to that, as well as the temporal diversity for, of climate change and environmental change over the last 14,000 years, you can see the tremendous diversity that presents itself there in this study. So um, I started off as kind of a classic ethnobotanist uh, in the 1960s. Um, my supervisor, Roy Taylor, was good friends with Brent Berlin. Some of you might know of him and Peter Raven. They, those three uh, were, were good friends. And when I was looking for a project to work on, um, Roy suggested I talk to Peter Raven, and Peter Raven suggested that I talked to uh, Brad Perrin and to look at classification systems, the way people name and classify and group plants and how that reflects the vegetation or the history of the people. And I ended up doing a three-way comparative study between Haida, which is a, a language isolate, but a coastal First Nation on Haida Gwaii, formerly Queen Charlotte Islands, the Newhall or Bellacula people, uh, who are also coastal, but are Salish-speaking people um, on the central coast, and the Lillowet or Sklepimuk people, 
who are Salish and people who uh, live in the interior more. So you have a three-way contrast in two languages that are related to each other and two languages, language groups that are situated in, on the coast. And uh, you can look at the way uh, they organize the, the plant world. So um, I documented the names of plants in those languages and the uses of plants and information about the plants. But in those days, it was taught just blankly. People are called hunter-gatherers. And that is kind of a put-down, as far as I'm concerned, when I think about it. It, it sort of implies a randomness, a thoughtlessness to the way people are using their environments. And I've come to learn over time that, uh, that the systems that people have developed for um, producing the food and the materials that they need uh, to sustain them is anything but random. It's very sophisticated and very complicated and complex. So this story is about my work with Quatsi Stala, T. Fadendit, Mary Thomas, and uh, the elders from the Tsilkotin area. And so in the, uh, in the 1990s, I was <coughs> sitting with Adam and, uh, and his wife, Kim Rekhamakudisi, talking about this plant, Fritillaria cantitensis, the rice root, northern rice root. And Adam was telling me how they, uh, when he was a boy, they used to go down to the tidal marshes where this plant goes and they would harvest it and it was an important food uh, for them. They call it kukwum and that's the, the Nuhok name as well. The Nuhok borrowed it from, uh, from Kwakwala or the other way around. So Adam was talking about that and he said yes. And he talked about a little sprout, which he called the gagam. And he said, that was my job, to pick them off. It's on the bottom. It's called the gagam. Gagam means grandfather in Kwako. <laughs> then they told me to throw it back in the garden when they were digging these roots. It's like a cup, and that cucumber sits in there. That was my job as a kid when I was with the old people. And so it took me a while to trying to figure out what the gagam was. It wasn't the little rice-like goblets that surround the bowl. It was something else, something bigger. And when we went out to Adam, to the place where he went, he showed me, and that's what they are. They're like large sprouting goblets that, are, that break off and split off from the main bowl. And so those were what he was talking about. So, of course, I had to check in my scientist brain so Adam, is that going to grow into a new plant? Yes, that's why we did it. <laughs> you dummy. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. <laughs> but yes, that's why we did it. <laughs> so the next summer, I was up talking with Mary Thomas, up, way up in the interior in the Shuswap country, near the Rocky Mountains. And she started talking about going out with her mom and her grandmother. And they would dig the roots of called shui, the bulbs of the glacier, yellow glacier lily. Skamich in some of languages, but shui in Shwetan Kajin. And she said, yeah, and she was talking about how they only dug the great big ones. Um, they, were, they had to be that, that big, and that big fat. And her grandma would go through their baskets. The kids would pick the bulbs up, put them in the basket. Grandma would go through and pull out the little ones, put them back. And then she said, yeah, we buried back the little ones. And when you look at the root, when you get there's this little right on the end, it looks like it's got little whiskers attached to the bulb, the root. You had to clip that off and throw it back in the soil where it was growing so it would grow back again. And she talked about how the mom to bring the basket of sweet bulbs back to the camp at night and she'd go through and clean them and she'd make a little heap of those little whiskers and then the next day when they went back to pick them she would plant them out again and this was amazing to me 
these two things side by side, different plants, different people, different language groups, different habitats, but the same practice of taking a small propagule and planting it back in the ground. That started me really off on a whole different way of thinking and looking at what people were doing for food production. And then later on, when I was working uh, with the Tilko team, Ath an Athabascan group, whose uh, territory is just north of, well, it's sort of south central British Columbia, north of the Salish and people's territories. Um, they had a special practice that I was told about. When a woman lost her husband and she was grieving and she couldn't be comforted, they told her to go up on the mountain and to pull up these plants, the, uh, they call it tsunkni, the mountain potato or the spring beauty. When they go to, when they dry back a little bit, they turn yellow and the stems kind of wilt. That's when you pull them up and you throw them around to places where the ground is bare and where there's nothing growing. And that'll make you feel better. And I just happened to have found some of those stems that were like that. They were just finished flowering and I pulled them up and put them into an envelope and I have to admit I forgot about them for a couple of weeks. And when I opened the envelope, guess what I found? Little black seeds. And we planted those seeds, and guess what? They grew into new plants. And the Tsilko team people will say, the mountain where they're talking about, it's called Potato Mountain in English. Guess who's responsible for all those potatoes growing in Potato Mountain? It's the Tsilko team practice of reseeding areas. And if you go up there, when the plants are flowered, and you look out across the subalpine meadows. It's like the stars in the heavens. It's just like white as far as you can see. Maybe like a snowfall. It's so dense with those plants. And the picking of them, the digging of them, um, it's, everyone would do that every year. And you only take the biggest ones, the ones that are like the size of walnuts. You wouldn't think of taking the ones the size of marbles. So putting those three things together, and a lot more besides, um, I suddenly appreciated that here was a different kind of cultivation, a different kind of sustaining resources than that the European newcomers to the area conveniently were blind to. They could conveniently overlook. Uh, and I won't go into the colonial history of our area, but um, it was the, the people here being called mainly fishers and hunters, uh, they, they weren't seen to need a large land base. And so they were confined to very small reserves and their traditional territories were generally taken away for settlement for matching, for industrial development, forestry, and, uh, and of course, urbanization and so forth. And talking to Adam Moore, and I'm sorry, this is uh, hidden by the picture, but keeping it living is the phrase that Adam used to translate the kwakwala word, kwakwala au. And this is one way of looking at this new way of uh, um, managing or thinking about management, and it suddenly occurred to me, every single plant that people use in this whole region, they're almost all perennials, and they all have capacity to regenerate by seed, yes, but also vegetatively, or to keep living, or to just reproduce by partial fragmentation, or to keep living if you take a piece, a branch or a piece of bark, you can keep the plant going. And so this whole idea um, that Adam helped me to come to see uh, stems from that. And some of you might know the book that Doug Dewar and I co-edited called Keeping It Living that's based on that word. So just backing up a little bit, again, uh, the, the, the good definition that my friend Vickert Burkus uses for traditional ecological knowledge, sometimes called indigenous knowledge or indigenous ecological knowledge, 
um, I always make a point of saying that the tradition doesn't mean that it's back in the past. It, it's just that it's based on a long, solid foundation of knowledge and history. A cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission. And I love, this is one of my favorite, all-time favorite pictures that I've taken, and that's uh, Helen Clifton showing her little granddaughter how to pound halibut walks, which are dried halibut slabs. And Janelle, who's now quite a big young woman, um, probably doesn't even know that she's learning. But there she is doing things with her grandma, which is fun. And she's got her own little tool, and she's got her own halibut, and she's helping. And that's one of the main key ways that that knowledge system is passed down during those times of working together. And if you think about the, the traditional ecological knowledge as a system of knowledge, it has different components to it, I guess. There's the practical knowledge of seasons and what's edible and what isn't, where to go and what to call things and what eats what, all of those practical things that you absolutely have to know. But there's also other elements. Um, the, the underlying worldview or belief system that goes with that kind of knowledge. The ways the knowledge is passed on, which I just talked about, but there are other ways as well, through stories, songs, language, and formal teaching as well. And there's social institutions that facilitate the way people interact with each other and with the land. And it's got a long time frame that I like to think is cyclical because it works with the seasons, with the generations, with the tides, and with so forth. Uh, there's, there's many repetitive strands to it, and it's never quite the same, but it's not linear knowledge. It, it, uh, is based on <coughs> previous knowledge. There's my friend Mary harvesting uh, cherry bark for a basketry, and uh, she, the way she's done it, after thanking the tree, she's cut it very, very carefully to peel off the outside layer of the bark, and the inside layer will harden up and will protect the tree, and it will continue to live and uh, grow and thrive. So here's an example of the practical knowledge uh, the, uh, what we might call phenological indicators, the use of life cycles of one organism to better understand what's happening to another organism. And, and it's often, uh, <clears throat> very commonly, fishing is associated with ecological indicators from the land. Because, for example, for the Scotland of people going down to the river, it's a huge investment of time. It's like straight down for a half a mile down to the river from where the village is. And so you don't want to do that every day just to see whether the spring salmon have arrived oh. <laughs> coming out the river. So you look for indicators like the blooming of certain flowers. The first run of spring salmon is indicated by the sagebrush buttercup blooming. And that, one is, that flower is called the spring salmon eye. And it blooms in February, early March. And then there's a later blooming of the rose, which uh, matches the second run of the spring salmon. And then there's grasshoppers in summer that mark the sockeye and so forth. Uh, in terms of beliefs and worldview, um, I love this quote that uh, I based the title of one of my books on, The Earth's Blanket. Um, but it was from the notes of James Tate from the Nkakatma people. Flowers, plants, and grass, especially the latter, are the covering or blanket of the earth. If too much plucked or ruthlessly destroyed, earth sorry and weeps. It rains or is angry and makes rain, fog, and bad weather. And to match that, the uh, statement by Roy Ayupas, the Chanoth elder, the idea and practices of over-exploitation are deplorable to our people. The practices outside our realm of values, and you can find parallel and similar ideas and thoughts right across the First Nations I work with. It doesn't mean that people don't over-exploit sometimes, but the main teaching is you don't do that. And sometimes people will transgress and there's stories about that and what happens to them. There's some kind of retribution that happens. And there's another idea that's central 
uh, to many First Nations, and that is the understanding that all of the different plants and animals and fish and birds, trees, are sentient beings and, in fact, are, are relatives. And that's been called kin-centricity or kin-centric ecology by uh, Dennis Martinez and Enrique Salman, among others. And here's an example from 1915 Curtis uh, uh, book about the Kwak 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 that they call a standing tree that they take boards from, a cedar tree. Uh, they call it baked. They bake a board from that tree. Since trees are believed to have sentient life, and so they would ask the tree, uh, bake for it to provide for them, tell them why they need it. And the same is made for a new tree when you cut off a branch to make a wedge or, or a mallet or something like that. It's a totally different relationship that people have with the things that give, the, give to them than most, most people in Western society would have with, say, the trees and the forests that they're going to log. And you can see culturally modified alder tree up there where somebody has carefully cut a piece of bark for medicine, but not circled the tree specifically so the tree will remain alive. And always the gratitude. Mary talked about her mother, Christine Allen, who lived to 102. And even as an elderly woman in her late 90s, if somebody gave her a gift of wild strawberries or some other treasured food, she would never just eat it. She always would say, Cooks chama, cooks chama, cooks chama. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then she would eat it. So eat that teaching of being grateful for what you receive and thank you, uh, the, the one that offers it to you. And children are taught these things from a very early age. Not the practical knowledge only, but the values to say thank you, to recognize the other species, to share what you get, never to waste those values. Ah, it worked. <laughs> So I, I played this in Anthony's class yesterday, was it? Uh, <laughs> seems like a long time ago. Um, but I, I put this in here as kind of a neat example of how uh, a lot of different aspects of traditional ecological knowledge are brought together in this one bird song of the Swites and Thrush, which is called up and down the coast the salmonberry bird, or quit, or quilesh. And, and its song actually says the names of the different varieties, the different colors of the salmon berries that the song is making to ripen. And everywhere you go up and down the coast, there's stories that relate to the salmonberry bird and uh, how it makes the salmon berries ripen. And, it, and it, if you've ever been out in a place where that thrush is singing that beautiful fluty song, you can almost feel the salmon berries ripening. So it's a teaching method. It's to, to teach uh, young people about when the salmon berries are good and the names for the different colors of berries and the fact that there are different varieties um, and the importance of this little bird uh, in the whole scheme of things. And I told a little story to the, to the group the other night about how uh, salmon berry bird um, fed Raven dinner by singing and having his children go out and get get uh, lots of salmon berries and Raven gobbled them all up and then invited Swinks and Stretch to his house to thinking that he could do the same thing, <clears throat> giving his kids the basket and telling them to go out and then him singing. <coughs> <coughs> and of course, no berries. <laughs> and there's lessons there. And so it's kind of a funny little story that children are taught, but they're also taught, you know, everyone has their own talents, and you shouldn't try and steal other people's talents. You should just choose your own. That kind of lesson is implied in stories like that. And I put this in especially for Steve Agastol. You don't know where you are, Steve, but... And for all of you who, who love tarot, because this is our West Coast uh, Carol family, or you see this, what's called skunk cabbage, some people want to call it swamp lantern, 
um, but it's a, it's a plant that, whose roots are eaten sparingly in times of food shortage. But it has many uh, important uses, especially the leaves, and some of them can be as tall as me and this wide. And they have a waxy coating, you can see the shine on the leaves, that are good for, gross, uh, for making berry cakes, for example, or wrapping food in, or making a drinking cup, or something like that, uh, for processing food, in other words. Uh, as well as medicine for various purposes. And there are many stories about this and the blooming of the skunk cabbage in the early spring is an, a phenological indicator. But one of the things that I did when I wor started working on the book, I made this database of the names of plants and all the languages, those languages that I could find, all 50 as much as I could. And then I looked at, uh, I color coded the, uh, the names that were related one to the other, and looked as far as I could tell for the Proto Salish or Proto um, Athabascan uh, roots for those words and tried to figure out how those words and names spread across all these different languages. So there's just one example, and I'm not going to go, go into it, but you can see that both Wakashan and Salishan languages share uh, the. the um, ancestral uh, origin of the name for skunk cabbage in this set. The other set is even more interesting because this word, timat or tibut, timat, um, is found in the Nutanif languages and the Maka on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the Olympic Peninsula. And then you get it again over in the eastern part of the Salishan uh, territories right over to Montana with the Salish, and Tanaha has borrowed it into their language as well. So that just shows long ago, people must have shared that word. How did they meet? How did it happen? And how did that get disseminated? So um, those are you know, some of my efforts to try and understand better those connections, ancient ancestral connections. And then there's stories, as I mentioned, there's a Haida story recorded by uh, John Swanton and illustrated by my friend Barb Wilson's brother, it came to us as a skunk cabbage man there, that uh, <clears throat> rather um, dignified looking man with a yellow cape. Uh, but it's about uh, a time of starvation when a young man went out and dug a hole in the ground and the next day he came back and there was a salmon in it. And then he dug a bigger hole, and the next day there were two salmon, and so forth. So he managed to get enough salmon to feed uh, his family. And one time he snuck around, he wanted to see where those salmon came from. And when he, he was looking, he saw Skunk Cabbage Man. Skunk Cabbage Man was the one bringing the salmon and putting them in the, the hole. And then, so that's Haida, up on the islands just uh, opposite the Alaska Panhandle there. If you go down to the mouth of the Columbia River with the Kathlamet, uh, Franz Boas recorded a neat story uh, back in 1901 about the people in mythical times who were dying of hunger and they, could, they only had the wapito and skunk cabbage and a couple of other kinds of roots from swampy areas to eat. And then in the spring of the year, when the salmon people finally came up the river, they heard a voice on the bank saying, if it hadn't been for me, the people would have starved. And they went over, and there was skunk cabbage. And as a reward, they gave him an elk skin blanket and a war club. And that's why skunk cabbage has that beautiful flower. And so those stories are kind of parallel. They're kind of similar in their themes. And makes me wonder just, you know, how did, how did they connect or were they independently derived? I'm not sure yet. I don't have answers. Just lots of questions. <laughs> so if we think of traditional ecological knowledge systems as a knowledge, practice, belief complex, um, Fikret Berkus has suggested that maybe as people come into a new area, they might uh, develop 
gradually develop first the local knowledge about what's good to eat and what isn't, that sort of thing, then how to manage and uh, increase or enhance or maintain production of those things through management systems, then develop social institutions that help them to manage and regulate themselves, and finally, maybe last, the whole belief system that is so deep and so ingrained that um, it's often overlooked in, in knowledge systems. So I guess I talked about the traditional uh, ecological knowledge. A key component of that is the management of, or you, you could say other things like stewardship or product production. I like to use management, some people don't, but for me it comes from French, men, the hands. And so it's something that you work with your hands. And I don't see that as a derogatory kind of description of the way people work with other species. So um, just like the knowledge system itself, uh, it's these traditional management systems are working with natural processes all the time. You know, soil building, photosynthesis, reproduction systems, fertilizing forth. And grounded again in the beliefs and worldviews and the responsibility that people have. What I call the human services to nature instead of the other way around. And here's some of those things that uh, go with that idea of keeping it living. Uh, as illustrated by Helena Myers uh, collecting the cambium, the inner bark and uh, lone inner uh, cambium tissues of <coughs> Lodgepole pine in these long ribs, sweet tasting, juicy ribbons that they sometimes call pine noodles. Mm -hmm. And again, they just harvest a part of the bark. They don't girdle the tree because they know that that would kill the tree. So you can still find all up and down the interior, you find pine, and on the coast, you find cedar and other trees that have long ago, sometimes as much as 500 years ago, had part pieces harvested from them and are still growing and living. So these are some of the things that people were doing, pruning berry bushes to regenerate the, the young growth, um, you know, weeding out grasses from the root garden, um, fertilizing, mulching, tilling, sometimes during the harvesting process, replanting and transplanting, um, creating habitat through fire or other forms of clearing, and uh, social management as well. So here's one example of Sioux from the Kit Kat Nation, the one that Helen Clifton belongs to. Uh, this is Elizabeth Dundas showing a practice that they hadn't done there for about 50 years or more. In fact, um, I'll just show you quickly. Elizabeth's using a special scraper on the Semapolis fur bark square to scrape off the edible part, which comes on the inside of the bark in this case. Her brother, Archie, the late Archie Dundas, he showed me this tree. It's right up the path from the village. He said, that's the last time anyone's harvested suit. I got that square in 1945. Oh. So there it is, and that shows the top of the tree. It's still living after all that time. It's starting to grow in, but it's still there as evidence of past harvesting practices. It goes for a lot of different harvesting. Mary talks about how you have to be so careful when you're getting the birch bark for your basket. You don't cut through that thin pulp that covers the tree. The sap will start to come out, and you deprive the tree of the sap. Once the bark's taken off, it will not grow back, but that pulp will turn into a hard surface, and that protects the tree keeps the tree alive. The same with a whole lot of other herbaceous perennials that people harvested for food and materials, like the cow parsnip heraclium, where you only get the sprouts in the springtime and you always have to peel them before you eat them, but it's the most predominant widespread green vegetable of springtime throughout that entire area. There are names for it, sometimes two or three names for that plant in different parts of it in every single language. And so people get it in the spring and just cut back a few shoots just like you would your 
growing asparagus. And then you leave it to grow after that and it will regenerate itself. And you can keep it growing like that and harvesting from it for decades and decades from the same plant. The same with a lot of the materials that people get, from the cattail to the stinging nettle to the uh, dog vein, hemp, hemp dog vein, or the um, sedges that they used to make the little beautiful trinket baskets from. All of those are herbaceous perennials. The tops are going to die down in the winter time anyway. So if you wait until the plants are mature, often until they've had a chance to produce flowers and fruit, and then you cut them back, you're actually creating a nice space for the new plants sprouting out next year to grow. And they're actually going to thrive under that regime of being cut back at that time of year. So you can get an almost endless supply for generation after generation. So uh, there's these kind of ecological resource management practices that uh, re regeneration that I already mentioned, scattering propagules, using perennials' capacity to regenerate through partial harvest. And then there's the habitat creation and ownership of by a family or by an individual, so that there's some constancy of use and some control over how much is harvested. If you have an open harvest system without any kind of proprietorship involved, uh, there's a danger of people coming in from different places and over harvesting. So that's one of the things that was very important, especially on the coast, that individual chiefs, that it's not that they claimed everything, and not that they had it for themselves, but they had the position of being having to look after that resource and share it with people in an equitable way and make sure that future generations also had the ability to access that. So multi, it allowed multi-generational monitoring of plant and animal populations. So all of these are kind of social, I guess you could say, social aspects of plant management that you see a lot of and, and uh, it helps people to be resilient because they can communicate back and forth, they can make sure that resources are distributed uh, from family to family or from group to group. Um, it allows opportunities for learning through uh, the potlatch or feasting where people come together and where the chiefs and leaders and elders will talk and talk tell the histories of the people, the origin stories, and so forth. So all of these things help in perpetuating the knowledge that goes with the management. And there's Adam out in his tequilac root garden. He's showing how they lined up the plots, the root plots, with the mountain peaks, one there and one back there. And they put posts in different places so the families would know where their root patches were. And he stood there out in this amazing river estuary in a boat and he, he said there was not one inch of this estuary, not one square inch that wasn't part of our tequila root garden. So distributed harvesting where uh, you, you go and get one kind of resource at one time and then you leave and you go to another place and get another. Or one family will go here to get this and another there to get that. That's also part of this management system. And here's uh, Adam and my friend Dr. Daisy Sue Smith talking about this resource ownership. Everybody has their own berry patches, their own clam beds. You don't just go out and pick. There's certain places that a family goes. Our family used to go here. Other families go over here. People would use pegs to mark off their gathering areas. And that included all these different, the tidal root gardens, the clam gardens, cranberry patches, berry patches, and so forth. If it's paid, you know it's somebody's. And again, they do not take all of the cedar bark, the people in the olden days said. Uh, it, uh, they peel off all the cedar bark. This is where the practical strategy is tied in with the belief. The young cedar tree would die, and then another cedar tree nearby would curse the bark peeler so that he would also die. Therefore, the bark peelers never take off the bark off the young tree. And sure enough, here are a couple of our students 
with an amazing old culturally modified tree from the central coast near Bella Bella, showing a couple of places where bark has been taken off in the past. Probably uh, it could be as much as 100 or more years ago. You could see uh, the trees gradually growing back over. So just a few examples, um, and I'll run through this very quickly, but the uh, camas uh, and savanna, oak savanna, habitats around Victoria. When the first settlers came, they thought, this is amazing, it's a perfect Eden. It's these big, beautiful oak groves with wild flower prairies in between. And uh, it, it must be like a work of divine art. <laughs> And it was indeed a work of art. Um, and then about berry production, about seaweed, one of my favorite things, especially because the seaweed that I'm going to talk about is, is Pyropia abwati, named after Isabella Abbott from mm -hmm. here. And, uh, and then about the tequila estuarine gardens. So the Camas prairies, this is what uh, Victoria, all of the southern Vancouver Island, as well as a lot of the uh, Puget Sound area right down through Oregon and Northern California looked like. And this is an anthropogenic landscape. It's a landscape that was being maintained without too much brush through the use of fire, but very careful controlled fire. My friend Arvid Charlie, um, Luce Chin from the Cowichan Nation, said they even have to know what the tide's doing because even though it's far away from the ocean, the tides and whether they're high or low or rising or falling determine what the winds are like and you have to know about the winds before you do your burning. All of those things, it's a, it's a really uh, expert practice but it's been banned for so long that there are very few people who know actually how to do that traditional burning anymore, especially not in the settled areas of our province. So for camas, one of the staple root vegetables of uh, the southern part of Vancouver Island and, and various other parts of northwestern North America, um, people would not only burn to clear the prairies, but they would selectively harvest, time the harvest so that the seed capsules are ripe and the seeds are dispersed while they're harvesting. They had tended patches that families owned and they would go from one area to another to allow the bulbs to regenerate themselves. And Dr. Brenda Beckwith, Beckwith did her PhD work on this plant and followed Camas production over a five-year period. And by the time she tended these bulbs and uh, weeded them and looked after them and dug them up after five years, they were like you could hold three big ones in your hands like that. And another one of our students did her research on harvesting camas. These are all bulbs found within one square meter of Camas Prairie, up near Duncan. And you can see the age groups. There's tiny ones up near the surface, the one-year-old. The two-year-olds are a little bit lower. Then they get long and skinny. About four years, they form a pencil, and they push themselves into the ground. And the harvestable ones, the ones that are harvestable age, are deep in the ground. And so when you're digging, you're digging at the time the plants are going to seed, you're um, turning the turf over using this amazing implement, the digging stick. And you can reach into the hole that you created, pick out the big bulbs, and then flip it back. And the little ones on the top stay intact, and they'll be maturing. And three or four years you come back, they'll be ready to harvest as well. And many species were managed in this way. The camas is just one example. The nodding onions um, and various kinds of wild berries really would thrive under a fire regime. Uh, about three or four years after a fire, the berries were just, you could pull them off by the handful. And then gradually, as it bushed over, then they would burn it over again. And also tied in with hunting, because the deer and elk like those burned over prairies as well. So for berry production, there are about 50 or 60 different kinds of wild berries. I call them wild, but we could say tended berries that people used to harvest routinely in huge quantities. Like we're talking for camas, for example, a family would harvest 200 
uh, pounds or 100 kilograms or more of those balls. And if you work it out for the number of people there were and the number of communities, that's about, it works out to about 10 million bulbs a year on southern Vancouver Island alone that people were harvesting in the old days. And yet, the best places to get camas bulbs, guess where? The places where people used to harvest them. Berries were tended, the bushes were pruned, sometimes with the branches on, take berry-laden branches back to the elders who might not be able to get out to the berry patch so they could pick. But it had a dual purpose of renewing, regenerating the berries. Uh, Adam calls it buckwheat. We break off, it's, it's a practice, we break them. So the berries would grow plentifully. A lot of people think we never touched the wild berries, but we did, we cultivated it, we pruned it. Especially that guadams, the red elder, red huckleberry. When they finished picking the guadams, you know, they prune them. They break the tops off. The same with the salmon berries and other berries. Burning also, as I mentioned, also improved the growth of berries. And many of the Saskatoon's black caps, if, uh, trailing blackberries, if you want to get lots of them, you go to a place that's been recently burned over. Saskatoon berries are a big, big, important fruit for First Nations, especially up in the interior, but also on the coast. And they've transplanted different varieties to different places. They pruned, they cut them right back down to the bottom. And they grew up nice long shoots that they used for basketry and so forth. And about three years after, they produced lots and lots of berries. Harry Nice mother, Emma Nice, from the Nass Valley, her grandmother, um, or Harry's grandmother, was blind, and his grandfather would bring berry bushes and plant them all around her house so that she could go out and pick berries, because um, she loved berry picking. And those are still there. All of these berry bushes are growing all around her house still. Cyril Carpenter, my friend from the Helps of Nation, told me, his grandmother told her about places, and told him about places where they had berry gardens beside waterfalls and south facing slopes where they fertilized the berry bushes with fish guts and other uh, animal remains. She said you could just pull the berries off by the handful. And then there's places where there's whole suites of different berries and fruits that are growing and obviously tended. So here's the seaweed, the py uh, pyropia, formerly Porphyra abati, and other species that people still harvest by the hundreds of pounds, uh, and spread out on hot rocks to dry in the sun, and then dry and uh, process and serve in various different ways. And again, you can see from the words how widespread the knowledge about using the seaweed is, because almost all of the names up and down the coast from the Puget Sound to Alaska come from the same root word, and they were borrowed up and down the coast. Phenological indicators, when the nettles get this high in the camp, they, they know the seaweed's growing at that same rate, so they go out to get it. And there are special places where the seaweed was ready earlier, and they would know where those were, and then they'd go to another place later on. Sometimes they pick two crops from the same rocks, one in early May and one in late May. The month of May is Halilakla'as, the month for picking seaweed. And as Helen says, it's just like any garden. It has to be tended. It will grow stronger and better if you pick it, if you pick it in a certain way, twisting it and pulling it off. It'll grow from the base again. And the same with eelgrass, uh, which is a traditional food for the Kwapakwak. Adam Dick worked with uh, our student Severn Kawa Suzuki to better understand that management system. Um, and she showed through experiments that when you harvest clumps of eelgrass with a special implement called a kilpayu, which is made from hemlock with a curved bottom to it, and twist it, um, it leaves a patch in the eelgrass bed that quickly gets grown in by tender young shoots of eelgrass, which are then very uh, tasty and tender for grants and geese who like to browse on those plants as well. Again, lots more to tell you about eelgrass, but we just need to move on. I've already talked a little bit about the root gardens and how the, the different uh, root vegetables, the hucum was only one of four that Adam went to get. And he said, 
fertilizing, cultivating, cultivating. That a native clover, trifolium, when we're in Siodii, the rhizomes, uh, the huqua, the glick sound, silverweed, um, Argentina egedi, formerly Potentilla pacifica, and uh, the nuca lupin, those were the four roots that people would cultivate. And they had these special gardens uh, mapped out, and they would build up the rock rock work to create a, a broader spread of the root gardens, just like they did with clam gardens. Clover land is very valuable for this reason, that they're uh, important food, and for this reason, the land is well cared for. Similar with other resources, with deer, people were very careful to, to watch the deer populations, and if the deer stopped um, producing twins, for example, then they would stop hunting them from that area. Same with salmon. They were very carefully tended and managed. And Tom Thornton, some of you know of his work, he's done a really nice study on salmon management. So these are the traditional management systems that were sustained often in situ over generations in, in uh, special places throughout people's territories underlain and supported by belief systems. And of course, you can imagine the impacts that these systems and the knowledge that goes through them have undergone since the uh, colonial period. The knowledge and protocols with, associated with this management are built up over generations of observation, experience, practice, monitoring, adaptive management. You could say some embedded in age-old narratives and ceremonies, like the first food ceremony which in turn reflect and are reflected by people's belief systems. People must have been long-term observers of other disturbers of resources like bears and beavers and birds. And so um, it's, it's time that we started to reevaluate what indigenous people's land use has been. And I know that it's the same here, that there are many practices uh, here that people have used that have never been really recognized because they're so different from the standard agriculture, what we call the Mr. McGregor style of gardening. <laughs> so colonial officials got it wrong. Plants were important. And people did influence the habitats and cared for them, but in ways that were hardly scarcely uh, visible to the newcomers. In a time when our world is becoming more homogenized, our environments and species are being kind of mixed up and spread all around the world. We need to think carefully about these different systems where we have environmental degradation and loss of all of these different valuable treasured habitats. We need to think about how these methods have been used in the past. And think about the amazing regenerative capacity of plants. And Mehana gave me some tea stems, again, symbolic of the amazing regenerative capacity of plants. If you just put these in the ground, they'll grow into new plants. And it's the same with the hupa. One little bulb like that can produce 107 new plants if you just spread them out. And the capacity for photosynthesis in the world is just as great as our ability to maintain forests and growing plants and gardens and not pave over our landscapes. And of course, we need, all of us, we need the sharing of this kind of knowledge. We need stories to help remind us about what we do, and ceremonies, and art, and music, poetry, all of these things that we need to help our minds think about these things at a broad level. The factual knowledge we need as well, but more than that, we need ways, different ways of valuing what is important in our lives, and we need different ways of decision making and governance. And I think First Nations knowledge and practice and there are many, many lessons here that can be brought 
if we respect that kind of knowledge and embrace it and work in a respectful and collaborative way with people all around the world to doing restoration and renewal, to observing and recognizing what's happened in the past and finding ways for reconciliation, as they're talking about in Canada right now with the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So for our survival as humans, we need to maintain and celebrate diversity, not homogeneity, biological diversity and cultural. This is happening in so many places I see when I go to visit and when I stay home too. I see so many leaders and experts and knowledge holders from local and indigenous communities who are really leading the way in revitalizing this knowledge and bringing it back. And this knowledge is now, I'm happy to say, I think it's taking a rightful place in society at large. I know it's happening here. I've seen it, I've talked to people about it, and I know it's happening in Canada. Mahalo. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.